Hi there, my name is Matthew Kaiba. I'm the curator of exhibitions. I'm here with artist Esma Mahmoud, a multidisciplinary artist from Toronto. And we're here to present the exhibition to play in the face of certain defeat. A lot of this exhibition plays with the notions of invisibility and visibility, seeing and not seeing, the multiplicity of blackness versus the monolith of blackness, all through the realm of athleticism. Throughout the show, we have a number of works that talk to different aspects of black identity, but also gender, hypermasculinity, economic subjugation, the destruction of black bodies. So it's quite a full show with uh, a number of these works that are very poignant and, and somber, really. One of the first works in the show is Glorious Bones. It's an installation of 46 helmets that have been covered in kente pattern cloth and it's sitting on a bed of recycled tires, which is meant to be evocative of Earth. As you can see with this installation, all of these helmets, they almost follow you, peering out as these raised memorials. Because of the joyful colors that are implied in it, it no longer feels like an attack on the viewer even though all the helmets are facing back in a very voyeuristic way and returning the gaze to the viewer, it doesn't feel as intimidating as it would if all the helmets were one solid color, for example. The seat above the table, Randall Cunningham, was inspired by the lack of representation in positions of power. I always felt that if there was seats that were available at the table, they were seats that didn't actually accompany power. And they were seats that were meant to be tokenizing or were meant as a facade to power. So I wanted to build a seat that rose above the table. Randall Cunningham was an extremely prolific passer and rusher um, as a quarterback in the NFL. And why this is of note is because there are so few black quarterbacks, black head coaches, black owners. If you look at the discrepancy between races within positions of power within the NFL, there's very little heterogeneity. The piece that we're looking at here is blood and tears instead of milk and honey. It's an installation of 22 branded footballs that are installed in a circle on the wall. One of the most important aspects of this work is the multiplicity versus the monolith, and it's directly speaking to what this exhibition is about. From a distance, all the footballs are black. You can't even tell that they have patterns. And it's only upon getting closer to the work that you actually realize that each football is branded. And to me, it was to highlight this idea of the monolith versus the multiplicity the invisible versus visible, and to highlight this singular note of blackness. And what does that mean when we're all collectively lumped into one identity? The piece that we're looking at here is Heavy Heavy Hoop Dreams. And it's an installation of 60 concrete basketballs sitting on black plexiglass. Each individual ball is indented in its own particular way, despite all of the balls originating from the exact same mold. So with this work, I was really trying to highlight the reality of what so many black men go through when they're geared towards sports their entire life and what it actually means when they don't make it to these goals. And that reality felt very heavy to me. Collectively, this installation weighs 1,800 pounds, each ball weighing 30 pounds. And I just wanted the weight of the work to pull through. I wanted a material that would be both heavy, strong, but also fragile in its way because I wanted to highlight the fragility of black masculinity. What we're looking at here is one of the boys black. The reason that I shoot my figures from behind is because I don't want them to be subjected to the voyeurism that the viewer inherently subjects them to. So for me, shooting them from behind also causes a barrier for whether or not that subject is male or female. Both the subject in black and the subject in one of the boys white are the same person. These works are indicative of what Esma, I think, felt growing up where it's so taboo to operate within a non-conventional understanding of Black masculinity, but also Black femininity. 
What we're looking at here is Chain Gang, which is a 30 foot industrial chain that has six cleats that hang off of it, hung from the ceiling down to challenge the conventional ways that chain gangs have been used throughout history, which is in a line that goes on the ground rather than a line that reaches up. The length of 30 feet or 10 yards represents the first down marker in football. But the term chain gang that actually is borrowed um, and used for NFL refs, ironically enough, was born out of the carceral system in the 1920s when America started to privatize prison systems and therefore had slave labor, again, predominantly black men who would do extremely arduous tasks out in the hot sun for basically no compensation whatsoever. So what we're looking at here is one of the boys black and one of the boys white in the dress installation. This installation is made up of repurposed jersey. It's made up of silk. This work is a very personal work to me because it came out of a childhood experience that I had where I was told that I was not one of the boys and this was my reaction. This work has been performed in, but now it's lived in a series of gowns that are vacant with an invisible mannequin. These Victorian dresses and dresses of that era were such a grand statement of femininity. So appropriating the basketball jerseys here really causes a schism or friction between the performativity of femininity and also the performativity of male identity. We're gonna move on to one of my favorite works in the show. It is a 16 karat gold mouth guard inside the wall guarded by a sheet of plexiglass. When you have a mouth guard in a player, it effectively silences them. It's very hard to talk and it's made of 16 karat gold. And you have that connection between wealth and affluence and silencing. The video that we're looking at here is a three channel video. The title of this work is From the Ground We Fall. And in this video, there are two men, one of which is my brother and one of his childhood friends. They were attached by chains and told to tear each other apart for the duration of the video. So they were pulling each other apart literally all day under the beating sun. And to me, it was evocative on the ways in which Black people have been pitted against each other, especially in sports. I think it makes conscious the viewer's complicity in the overall entertainment system that feeds us the degradation and the destruction of Black bodies. At the very basic level, this is the entertainment that we consume, that we spend billions of dollars on each year to see one person defeat another. I really wanted to open up the vulnerability of black masculinity and I wanted to show the softer side because I don't think that we, we really think of black bodies being deteriorated in this way because we say they're being compensated with money. These football players make millions of dollars, therefore it's okay to do this. And the reality is these men are tearing each other apart We have conversations about invisibility and visibility. We have the conversation of fragility versus hypermasculinity. We're having all these conversations, but this work is the pinnacle of all of those conversations. The idea of change, it's such a perfect metaphor for the entire show, where of course, you know, they're shiny, they, they have such a presence, but at the base level for the person wearing this, it's almost impossible to move. I'm making this work for the viewer, but I want the viewer to take away their own homework and really rethink the negative associations to blackness that we've had through the vernacular of athleticism. Yes, this is a show about sports, but its grounding force is about race and black bodies. I hope that people actually take something from the show in terms of their own preconceptions of blackness and black people and black culture.